How to successfully take a Botwin exam without really trying. Online version. So you're going to take one of my exams. Lucky you. Now, I believe exam taking is a skill, but I don't believe that my classes are about exam taking. So one of the things I'd like to do is discuss how I put an exam together, how I write questions, and how you should study for that exam. Because my goal is not that you learn some weird arcane style of taking examinations, but you learn the material and then are able to successfully take an exam. So in this little video, I'm going to present to you how to take multiple choice questions on one of my exams and give you some strategies for studying for those exams. This doesn't guarantee success. You still have to do the work, but knowledge is power. And like I said, test taking is not this class, whatever class you're taking. Okay, let's first talk about multiple choice questions because this is the online version and there are only multiple choice questions. Face-to-face -face classes, I make extensive use of essay questions, but that's not possible in an online class to do it with any kind of security. Now remember, as a student in an online class, you're taking exams under different circumstances than usual. So you want to provide yourself with a quiet place that you can spread material out on. I make the assumption that the exams are open book, open note. Uh, what else can I do if you're taking it at home? I can't be the thought police and run around and check on you and make sure that you're behaving yourself. Also, for my online exams, I do give you a time limit. And that time limit is based, depending on the class, uh, on the number of multiple choice questions in the exam times 90 seconds each. I generally set my multiple choice questions up so you should be able to answer them in about a minute. Some will take you a little bit longer than that. But we're using the Canvas Learning Management System. Canvas does not allow me to time questions. It only allows me to time exams. So, be cognizant of the fact that you have about that much time. Now, even that much time total isn't going to give you time to look up every single answer. I know you'll be looking some up. You'd be a really stupid person if you didn't. Uh, but remember, don't get lost looking for a answer for 10 or 15 minutes and then not be able to finish all of the questions in the allotted time. But I look at the stats after every exam, and so far in my experience doing online courses, students have generally all finished the exam with lots of time to spare. Now the general format for my multiple choice questions is relatively simple, something you've seen most likely, but, oh, sorry, quick click, before. Uh, each question will have a STEM question and then four options for the correct answers. Most questions that I ask are relatively short, one or two sentences each. Longer multiple choice questions, I may embed a story or scenario or something like that. I generally do not like to have these extremely long-winded multiple choice questions that sound like a legal document and end up with a not and you have to kind of go through and 
redo your logic. I do use the modifiers uh, in my multiple question, choice questions, like which is not an example of this theory, or what is something that, uh, for example, Socrates did not do. If I'm going to have that kind of a caveat in my multiple choice question, I try to at least uh, capitalize it. Having a little trouble with canvas editing to make sure I get the bold facing, but I try to have that there so it doesn't uh, mess you up. You don't misread the question. Uh, in fact, in Canvas, I'm also able to take the not and accepts and change them from black font to red so you don't miss the prompt. Here's an example of one of my multiple choice questions. This individual founded Microsoft. So you have four choices, Howard Wallowitz, Bill Gates, Charles Bell, and Steve Jobs. The answer obviously is Bill Gates. Remember to use the process of elimination to cut down on the number of options if you're unsure of an answer. So for example, if you know that Howard Wallowitz is a character for Big Bang Theory, now if you're guessing, it's out of three. And if you remember that Steve Jobs was one of the founders of Apple, that makes it 50-50. If you know that Charles Bell, doesn't that name ring a bell? Uh, was one of the discoverers of the differences between sensory and motor neurons, you realize it's left to Bill Gates. Of course, you most likely didn't have to do that process of elimination with this question, because the answer is quite obvious, hopefully. This one's not as obvious, um, which this individual is not a Marvel superhero. Then I have four female heroines, not being a comic book person, at least in my adult years. I think it's Wonder Woman, but I might get that answer wrong. Oh well, what can you do? I will never use this kind of form of multiple choice question. Uh, these are the officially sanctioned names allowed to be used for our university. California State University, Fresno State, CSUF, and then A and B, but not C. Uh, which is actually the correct answer for this question. Uh, the two official names for our university are California State University Fresno, which is our official name, and Fresno State, which is being used more and more to replace the official name, which has been kind of our informal name. But we're not allowed to use our initials to, do, uh, to define the university, uh, CSUF, because there's more than one CSU that is in a city with an F. So you have CSU Fullerton. They kind of get the rights to use CSUF. Anyway, that's irrelevant. Just a little bit of errata for you. But I won't use any of those weird kind of convoluted questions. There'll be one correct answer for each multiple choice question. And that's it. I'll also never do this kind of multiple choice question. Uh, what is in the box on page 46 of your textbook? And then there are several answers. Uh, including the one that I wrote that I'm most happiest with. Nothing is that important that you should memorize blank and blank and blank and page numbers. I'm worried about substantive content for the exam, not trivia like where the box on a page is and what's in it. 
if I, I want to know what's in the box and I want you to know something about the material in the box, I'll ask you a question about the material in the box, not where the box is. In fact, with my classes, I allow students to use old editions of textbooks, which serve us perfectly fine. And for page 46 may have different things in different editions. But you'll never get anything like that. If you find professors that uh, are teaching you and they're using questions like that, you could tell them I told them they're lousy question writers. Oftentimes students believe kind of strange things. And I always wondered this when I was a student taking a Scantron exam, although this may not apply as much to online exams. When I give a class an exam in a face-to-face -face format, we typically use the long green skinny Scantrons. And I know students look at the responses of the items and try to see if there's any kind of patterns. If they see a run of several correct answers, they think, well, the next one, I had three B's in a row. The next one can't be a B. Well, that's just a wrong-headed statement. It's kind of like the gambler's fallacy. When I set up my exams in Canvas, I have them set so the questions are randomly shuffled and also the answers. So it could, just through random shuffling of responses, end up with a run of several answers being the same or having the pattern A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D three times in a row. There's no conspiracy theory there. There's nothing to attempt to trick you. But I know a lot of students think that we embed response patterns into our Scantron forms. And there may be some instructors that do that. If you have one of those instructors, please send them my advice. Get a life. I don't know why you have so much time to waste doing such frivolous things. But remember, each question should be answered independently. Okay, now you're going to study for the exam. How are you going to do it? How are you going to effectively use your time to secure the knowledge you need to be successful on an exam, especially one of my exams? So I want to cover a couple of study strategies, tell you how I would do things. Now you don't certainly have to do things the way I do them. But since I wrote the test, probably should get in my mindset about how I do such things, which is what this presentation is all about. So I want to talk about reading, using the PowerPoints, and class notes, and things like that. Hang on. Okay. This is me. You may be a lot smarter than me, which is very conceivable. But I read technical things, textbook chapters, journal articles, things like that, at a rate of approximately 30 pages per hour for newer novel material. Now, you might read something faster. You may read it slower. But I just want to give you some context because I do use that rate to determine reading assignments for my course. So about 30 pages per chapter just to read it. It's not to study it. It's just to read it. When I have some time off, like during a summer, I will grab a novel, something fun to read, I like histor history, I like historical fiction, and I'll find out I can read 70, 80, 100 pages an hour, depending on the book. 
but I'm not reading it like I'm reading a journal article or a textbook chapter or some kind of technical material. So keep in mind the kind of material that you're going to be tackling when you're studying. You need not only to read the material, it's not enough to read it, you have to master it. To do that, you may have to go over that material several times. If I'm learning an article, just for the sake of learning the article for uh, part of being my job as a psychologist, and I'm reading a journal article, I'm, article, I'm going to read it once through. And then if I think it's an important article, I'm going to go through it again a couple more times just to make sure I didn't miss anything, just to make sure I've got a good feel as to what's there. Also, my first reading kind of gives me a map of where the article's going to go, things I wouldn't have seen uh, without reading it once. And now I have this map. I can use it to focus on those things that are important in my second and later reads. So you want to make sure you do that. Reading something once, not sufficient, not studying. Uh, big, big, big advice. Don't mark or highlight things on the first read. Now I know the marker companies aren't going to like me for this one, but I think you should throw all of your highlighters away. I know as a good student, you're supposed to highlight the important passages of your textbook. Uh, in fact, I can show you many of my old books full of marker. Why I suggest you don't use a marker highlighter. If you don't care about the book, go ahead and use the magic marker and color all over your book. Uh, I've been doing this as a professor for 30 years and a few years as a grad student before that. And I'm finding now in the advanced age of my books, not me, some of those early professional books that I highlighted with a yellow highlighter the highlighter ink is not only destroying the pages of expensive professional books, but it's getting real splotchy and dark. And sometimes it's hard to read those passages, especially if I've gone back and in my wanton youth used a blue marker. Those get really funky over the years. So if you really, really care about the book, I would not use uh, the marker, the highlighter markers. I do think you should highlight material, but my preferred way of doing it is to use a pencil. And I have a little six inch ruler and I simply underline those passages. It doesn't stick out as glaring like the yellow sore thumb on you do by marking up your book. But if you care about your books and you want to keep them, a long time it might be something to consider. If you're buying the textbook for this semester and you're going to get rid of it at the end of the semester and you don't care, well, do whatever floats your boat. I would first, if I were you, determine how much time you need to read and master the material. Now, I know it takes me about half an hour to read a chapter or about a 15-page journal article. So when you sit down and look at how many articles, if you have them in your course, how many chapters do you have to read? Figure out how much time you need just to do your simple reading and then add more time to it. Then I would literally eke out that time on my calendar to make sure you do the things. Now, there, I know the uh, from the way students talk that they say you don't really need to buy a book for my class. All you can do is follow the PowerPoints. That's incorrect. I do have copious PowerPoints. I do think I try to do a really good job on my PowerPoints. 
but they don't have everything there. What you want to do is you want to use the PowerPoint presentations because I'm highlighting the most important things in the PowerPoints and then for online classes, the associated videos. So look at that and that's where you need to focus your study. After your initial material, uh, after your initial reading of the material, focus on the material that overlaps the presentation. For those of you in my personality class that are using Funder and Ozer, uh, we may not talk about those in the PowerPoints or the lectures, but any material that has been assigned for that module is fair game for multiple choice questions. So I have gone through and written multiple choice questions on those original source articles. In a perfect world, I would sit each of you in front of me and have you explain the article to me. That'd be the best way to assess you. Can't do that one. But I can write multiple choice questions from Funder and Ozer, and I have and will. I find um, these are the mistakes when I sit down with a student and go over their exam that I typically hear about. The first problem I find is students are not thoroughly reading the questions. You have to make sure you read the question and read the question well. Don't skim at multiple choice questions in an exam. Now the second point here is something I find that my best students tend to do. They add stuff to the questions that isn't there. Uh, a lot of times I'll have a student come up after an exam and they'll be all huffy and puffy and upset because they have a question wrong and they can't understand why they got it wrong. And we'll talk about it and they'll say, but I thought you meant. Or I added this in. Uh, just as Freud said, a cigar is just a cigar. And I've got my, well, I'll say a cigar here to show that point. The questions are just the questions. Don't add anything to them. Now, you do have a time limit, but you don't want to rush and get done in 15, 20 minutes and not do a quality job. Uh, I should have added the last bullet point out because I'm not going to be there to answer your questions while you take the exam. However, if you have questions about the exam that are nagging you afterwards, send me an email. I don't want you angry at me for something on an exam question that you're upset with and we don't get a chance to talk about it, so you don't have to be upset. Biggest two problems students make in my exams, on my exams, not spending enough time to study. I know time is a major commodity for us, but you have to put the study time in. And you should be studying probably 15 to 20 hours per exam if you want to be successful. Two hours of studying the night before an exam is the road to failure. I can't tell you how many times that I'll have a student that will come to visit me in office hours halfway two-thirds through the semester and they failed three exams already and now they're starting to panic. Probably should have started panicking after failing the first exam. But I remember a flashball moment clear. Several students that I counseled on how to be successful in my classes late in the term, uh, one of the typical things I ask is, how long did you study? And I'll get, oh, I must have studied two or three hours the night before. 
it's not going to cut it. And studying just the night before the exam isn't going to cut it. You may occasionally be able to get away with it. If you're a genius, maybe you can get away with doing that. But I don't think the average college student can get away with two hours of studying and be successful in one of my classes or, frankly, any class, period. Last of all, don't panic. It's an exam. Don't freak out. Test anxiety is a killer. Don't let test anxiety mess up your scores. Relax before you take the exam. Take it in a comfortable, quiet place. Be well prepared. If you get stuck on one question, let it go. Move on to the next one. Missing one question on occasion isn't going to be that bad. But if you panic and don't answer a bunch of questions, that's going to be extremely problematic. So, as Douglas Adams, the author of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy says, don't panic, it's just an exam. And if you've been a student long enough, you know, there's always another exam coming. Finally, make sure you talk to me. If you have problems, I'm always open to help you learn better. That's the most important part of my job. So good luck on your exam. And we'll be seeing you online.